Welcome to Europe is here 2017. I'm Thomas Cusset from Marseille, France. And we know that this meeting focused on cardiovascular intervention and a very important component of cardiovascular intervention will be the adjunctive pharmacotherapy. And to discuss that and to see the new finding in this setting, we have the privilege to have Gabriel Steg from Paris with us. Hello. And uh, the first question I would like to ask you is uh, the main field of the Congress is still the coronary field as today. And we have a very specific subpopulation challenging to be treated is the patient undergoing PCI with oral anticoagulation. What are the new trends or the alternative strategy for this specific field? Yes, this remains a vexing problem for clinicians because we know that patients who require oral anticoagulation and combined dual antiplatelet therapy for stents are at very high risk of bleeding. And for years we've wondered about which is the optimal combination, intensity, duration of each of the components of this triple therapy cocktail that we use in these patients. We are starting to get answers. Uh, last year, the Pioneer trial was really a critical step in better understanding how to handle these patients. And what we've learned from Pioneer is twofold. First of all, we've learned that we can minimize bleeding by using novel direct oral anticoagulation, anticoagulant agents, which are associated with less bleeding than conventional vitamin K antagonists, particularly when we use them in reduced doses or even very reduced doses. The second thing we've learned is that we can abbreviate the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy following in the footsteps of the Woost investigators in the Netherlands who had already shown in the, in the largely stable patient population with vitamin K antagonists that you could drop aspirin early after PCI. Pioneer also showed that when you did this, that there didn't seem to be a major hazard associated with this, but it was really associated with reduced bleeding. And I think this is the primary concern in the field. Now, Pioneer is only one of a series of large ongoing randomized trials investigating the, investigating the various direct oral anticoagulant agents. This summer at ESC, we'll likely have the results of the redual PCI trial with, with the Bigatran. And then the Augustus trial AF is ongoing with the Pixaban. And a fourth trial with Edoxaban called Entrust AF is also just starting. So in the next two years or so, we should really have a wealth of information about how to handle these patients. And I think the future will likely confirm what we've already suspected from Pioneer, i.e. we need to abbreviate duration of cocktails, we need to reduce the doses, and we probably are better off for our patients using the novel oral anticoagulants rather than vitamin K antagonists. So that's great news. Evidence is coming which will really ease the clinical decision in daily practice with less drugs and shorter duration for less bleeding. Yes. The other topic which has been extensively discussed during the last year is the management of DAPT and mainly the DAPT duration. What are the new findings in this, in this specific setting or ongoing important studies? Yeah, this, is, this is a very important and interesting aspect of pharmacotherapy, adjunctive pharmacotherapy for PCI. And as you know, we've had some confusion regarding the interpretation of the evidence base we have. We have trials that suggest benefit of protracted dual antiplatelet therapy uh, in patients who undergo PCI, such as the DAPT trial, or in post-MI patients, such as the Pegasus trial. But on the other hand, we also have quite a series of smaller trials that show that it's possible to, quote, get away with shorter duration of DAPT therapy in other patients. And so who are the best candidates for each strategy? In whom should we abbreviate? In whom should we lengthen the therapy? I think we're starting to get to a point where we better understand this. And the key to this will be patient profiling using either clinical profiles, such as the MI patient versus the stable patient. And to me, that's a critical divider. If you're a post-MI patient, you're probably a default protracted duration uh, therapy of DAPT. Whereas if you're a stable patient, by default, my bias would be to use shorter duration DAPT. So that would be the two conversations that I would have that are very different. But we can refine this and we can use tools. And there are various risk scores that have been proposed over the past couple of years uh, that, have, that are intended to help guide us into deciding objectively what is the optimal duration of DAPT in patients. Very much the way we do it for atrial fibrillation 
who are the good candidates for anticoagulation using first of all the CHAD score and now the CHAD's VAS score. I think in the future we will do this. Now the tools we have are the DAPT score, the Paris score, recently the precise DAPT score. And I think one of the themes that is emerging is that a critical driver in uh, deciding the duration of DAPT is the risk of bleeding. So you have the risk of ischemic event that's largely based on patient profile and the risk of bleeding that you can tease out with scores and if you're able to quantify this, then you can get to a situation where you can literally individualize the decision-making process for each patient. We need more evidence. We need larger databases and validation of these scores. But I'm confident that in the next few months or years, we will get to a point where we'll ha we will have established risk scores to guide us. And do you think any future also for single therapy in terms of the, the APT after yes, PCS so and PCI? That is tantalizing. Now, uh, we're still awaiting the results of two ongoing trials, two large trials called Global Leaders and Twilight, that are exploring the ability to drop aspirin early after intervention and use single therapy, single antipathy therapy using a potent agent such as ticagrelor in patients undergoing PCI. I think the, these trials will be critical, critical to guide us and decide whether we can get away with that. It'd be terrific because we know that aspirin in combination with P2Y12 inhibitors increases bleeding, we're uncertain about the value it has as an additive component. And maybe the optimal scenario is one of single antiplatelet therapy. Okay. So just to summarize the DAPT, we have the feeling that now we will focus more on the patient than on the stent that we focused on the, for the last few years. And absolutely. it was probably not the good way I, to you, go. You, you're absolutely right. I think the conversation has been too long centered around the stent it's no longer a stent thrombosis issue. In fact, a lot of the events that are, we are preventing with dual antipathy therapy in patients who receive stents are not stent related. So it's really important to focus on the patient, the patient ischemic risk, the patient bleeding risk, and try to assess this as objectively as possible. There is another growing area for cardiovascular intervention. It's the structural heart disease, and the biggest part is probably the, today the TAVI. And here there is also important question as we have some valve leaflet thrombosis in the last few years which has been reported and there is no ongoing study. Could you please give us just an update and future strategy potential? Yeah. This is also fascinating. The antithrombotic therapy we use as adjunct to TAVI or TAVR has been largely empiric. We didn't have a very strong evidence base for that. Now we've learned over the past few years that there are some thrombosis of the valve leaflets and around the valves. We're uncertain about what is the clinical significance of this. We also know that the patients who undergo TAVR are at very high risk of developing other sources of thromboembolism, including atrial fibrillation, and maybe these are good candidates for anticoagulation in the first place. And so there are ongoing studies that are exploring the potential value of novel oral anticoagulation agents in combination with antiplatelet agents and what is the optimal duration, dose, and intensity and duration uh, of these various cocktails. And I think that it'll be fascinating to get the results of these trials. We're eager to get this in the next two years. But we still have to, to wait a little bit. Yes. Just coming back to the broad uh, cardiovascular disease, when we discuss about pharma, the first idea is to discuss about the APT and antithrombotic strategy. But more broadly, uh, what will be the next trend and improvement for the secondary prevention of the patient? As you say that most of the recurrent events will be non-stent related. So how will be the improvement of secondary prevention more broadly? I think it is important for us interventionists to be aware of the ongoing developments outside of, it, outside of intervention. And, and a good example is the uh, emergence of PCSK9 inhibitors and with their ability to dramatically lower LDL cholesterol. And now we know that this is truly resulting in plaque modification, plaque stabilization and regression, as was shown in the GLAGOF trial with IVUS, but also prevention of cardiovascular events, as was shown in the Fourier trial. And so if this continues to be confirmed by the upcoming other trials, uh, interven interventionists have to, will have to live with the idea that now equally important to interventions are pharmacologic interventions that also have the potential to improve patients' plaques but also events. In fact, I think it's a threat to interventions in stable coronary artery disease. Uh, we don't have strong evidence that interventions in stable coronary artery disease improve life expectancy or prevent cardiovascular outcomes. 
if the competing intervention is a drug that actually does that, maybe we'll have less patients to intervene on. And I think it's, uh, it's something we have to be aware of. The, and it's not solely PCSK9 inhibitors because we also have anti-inflammatory agents that are being explored, dramatic interventions to affect the LDL profile, triglycerides, HDL cholesterol, and so we might be able to really dramatically reduce the risk of cardiovascular events in secondary prevention with drugs without resorting to intervention. So it's important for us to be aware of these ongoing developments in the background that are literally threats to the future of per percutaneous coronary intervention for stable patients. Thank you very much. I think we, we are really, uh, we like to thank Gabriel Steg again because we had a fantastic update on all the ongoing studies in the different field of pharmacology for uh, cardiovascular intervention. And it seems really fascinating that every strategy will be challenged within the next few months and few years, and it will probably change and we will treat the patient completely differently, which will have an impact on the cardiovascular intervention. Thank you.